So the, the Soul Care Collective is a space for us to to um to just learn different ways to heal ourselves, um, experience soul expansion through breath work, through body movement therapy, um, cultivating intuition, really just tapping in with your higher self and aligning yourself with your divine image. And so that is the Soul Care Collective um, and what, what the intention of that is. But um, the ancestors were like, yeah, we have to start sharing some, some information about African history because um, it's just, without a doubt, there is a psychological linkage to the trauma and to um, our past, you know, and our past is not solely traumatic. But today, unfortunately, you know, we are talking about the Ma'afa, which is inherently a traumatic experience. Um, and so, of course, I would like to begin uh, in today's uh, study group with a libation to our ancestors. It's heavy information, and so we will close as well um, with a meditation, Omitutu, for our spirit, cool down our spirit, Oritutu, cool down our head. And um, we'll also uplift and elevate our ancestors who um, who are still whose spirits are still within uh, the middle patches in the Atlantic Ocean and who have not yet been ascended. So we will send them some love before we close as well. So um, let's just take a collective deep breath in and release. And breathe, breathe in and release. I am not at all excited about today's um, topic, but I'm going to channel one of my favorite black psychologists and psychiatrists, um, Dr. Francis Cresswell Singh, who to me is an example of supreme intelligence and peace. This woman has, this, has the ability to speak about the things that have happened to African people, the things that are happening to African people, the atrocities, and do it with grace and peace. And it's not to say she's not disturbed by it, but she has reached the level of spiritual cultivation where, okay, this is the reality and this, what are we going to do to fix it? You know, and her life was dedicated to the what we are going to do to fix it. And so I affirm that her likeness is, um, is um is with me today so that we can uh talk about this in a very peaceful way um without the fire so um so we will begin um libation and and i'll just flow from spirit um as a matter of fact i'll actually do the libation for my lineage i did it this morning but a double libation won't hurt Okay, Ashe. So, Omi Tutu, Omi Tutu, Omi Tutu, Omi Tutu, Tutu Ari, Tutu Emi, Tutu Aye, Tutu Ase Ori Egun Iwo Orun, Iba Ase Ori Egun Ariwa, Iba Ase Ori Egun Gunsu, Iba Bogbo Egun Orun, Moju Ba Bogbo Egun, Moju Ba Bogbo Egun. And I want to give special praise and honor to um, Baba Kobe KK Kambon, whose work we will be exploring today. Um, That's actually the first time Ashe, 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 Ashe the first time I've read or done libation or ancestral invocation um, on live. So I done said some things wrong and, and, and mispronounced it out of a little bit of nervousness, but um, the intention is pure and received. So I say to that. So today's reference for our study group is um, African Black Psychology in the American Context. An African-Centered Approach, and this is by Baba Kobe K.K. Kambon. This book fundamentally changed my life. I walked into graduate school um, at FAMU, Ashley Nicole Fries, and I left Omikunle Akundayo. I walked in Christian. I walked out, you know, <laughs> practicing Ifa, you know, closer to myself um, with a more uh, stronger sense of, of who I am and and my divine purpose, my divinity, my destiny. And so this book is very transformative and um, I hope to go through the chapters with us on um, on uh, on our soul care or through our study group. 
Okay. So, um, so again, uh, Baba Kobe, KK Kanban, who recently transitioned in, um, was it, it was, it was January, it, January 20, January 2019. Yeah. January 2019, Baba Kobe transitioned, I believe. Um, so we send you love. We, we thank you for your dedication to the work, Baba Kobe. We thank you for your dedication to the work, Baba Kobe. We give thanks to you. We give thanks to you for your genius. We give thanks, thanks to you for your divine intelligence, for just being so committed to this work and for being an amazing teacher. Baba Kobe was reserved, y'all. He ain't, you know, too much due to talking and and like the the after community, you know, community building things. To my experience, Baba Kobe was very reserved. This this was his work, and that's all he, you know, he he we needed, you know. So, um, I just give thanks to him. I give thanks to him, and I'm grateful for the time that I spent as a student of his, and I'm honored and grateful to be able to um to share his work with us today. One of the charges that he gives us to restore the cultural ego of African people is to actually have African history study groups and language study groups. Um, uh, and so I'm just, again, honored to, to do this work. So we'll begin. I, I encourage you to get some water, family. Um, get some water anytime you feel um, a little triggered by anything that's coming up today. Uh, just get some water. And drink the water, bless the water, pray over the water, ask that the water is um, is uh, bringing coolness to your spirit. Um, whatever prayers you normally say over your food, do so for your water as well so that we can call in whatever you need in, in the moment. So what is the Ma'afa? So um, the Ma'afa itself is, uh, the word translates to great disaster. It's a key Swahili word that translates to great disaster. And in my opinion, the invasion of Africa and um, the Ma'afa itself is the single most impactful historical event that is continuously contributing to the global um, oppression of African people throughout the world. I'll keep the book here so I don't have to look so far down. All right, there we go. So again, yes, so the Ma'afa is is in reference to the, the, the kidnapping and the enslavement of, of our ancestors. And so, yeah, and just really quickly as we move forward, before we move forward, the reason why we say our ancestors were enslaved as opposed to slaves, um, to say that you are a slave is to is to, to, to be in agreement with what is happening to you. To be enslaved, you didn't have a choice in that. And so um, we say enslavement because prior to, um, you know, prior to popular belief, our ancestors resisted. And that is the part that I can't wait for. I think we talk about the resistance on Thursday. Let me calm down. But on Thursday, we talk about the resistance. There was so much resistance that we don't talk about, you know what I mean? And because if we did, then we will be tapping into that consciousness, that consciousness of rebellion and resistance and revolution. But they don't want us to tap into that form of genetic DNA. They want us to tap into the trauma that we're going to talk about today. But today's discussion is important to know because um, we, for, we don't control our education, you know what I'm saying? Um, and if you were not blessed to have teachers that had knowledge of self and that were conscious, you were not told the right story in school. And so we are re-educating re ourselves through um, the African language study group or just a history study group because I don't think we're doing language today. Ashe, sister. Yeah. Yes, T. And Tierra is a teacher. We give thanks to you, sister. I know you out there, you know, spreading the, the truth, you know, to the students and letting them know what's real. Okay. So, um, okay, where are we going to start? Let's see. So the brutal enslavement of Africans by Europeans was, um, again, a primary historical trauma that threatened, if not totally severed, um, our connection. Africans um, who were who left Africa, that kidnapping, the Ma'afa, it told, for many of us, totally severed that connection. Some of us were able to, to remain connected through spirit, through dreams, through spirituality, 
um, just maybe even an unknowingness, hearing whispers, um, oh, she has sight, she hears, she does things, she gets the Holy Ghost. These are the ways that the ancestors continue to remain in contact with us. But um, when I say that it severed the link, it severed the identi the like, our identity and our connection to Africa in terms of knowing who we are and where we come from. Okay, and so the nature and the impact of the African Holocaust or of the Ma'afa, it must be brought into full analysis so that we can understand that it has been or that it is one of the most powerful disruptive forces in our, in our African continuity. And what that means is in our connection to being African, right? And to our acknowledgement of being African because there's so many... Um, um, black people across the diaspora who don't identify with Africa at all, which makes no sense. If you're, we're not going to go there. We have compassion for them, right? We send them love and we affirm that one day they, they tap into that connection. But we, we don't get upset with our brothers and sisters for not knowing something that we once did not know. So, okay, so let's see. So uh, probably one of the most troublesome issues about, we just talked about this, I'm gonna go ahead and skip that. So as a result of over 300 years of being bombarded with European miseducation, the misinformation, cultural indoctrination, and the, the, the brutalization of chattel slavery, again, we were made to disconnect ourselves from anything closely African. And so if, that is to be true, then how could we as their descendants be anything other than Africans, both racially and, and culturally? And so today during our study group, we will be examining the nature of the, Ma the Ma'afa, specifically in North America, from the vantage point of African Black psychology, because that is my background. Um, and we are we're going to explore the psychocultural consequences that it had and that it continues to have on black and African communities. So, um, so yeah, so, Af so European enslavement of Africans is sought to break the very will of Africans um, to exist even as human beings. Can you imagine? Well, yes, I'm sure you can. So that was literally the intention of the enslavement besides obviously them using us as chattel, um, our ancestors, but um, spiritually, the the drive of it was to break the, the will to even exist so enslaved africans was um let's see okay let's let's just go with it enslaved african life was an inconceivable experience of chronic psychological trauma horror um, misery suffering um, savage violence was all around our ancestors at all time they literally had to function under a constant state of terror and desperation 24 7 seven days a week and so before we even talk a little bit more about um uh, the six phases of the Ma'afa, let's address the elephant in the room. Did slavery exist in Africa prior to um, to the, the European invasion? Yes, slavery existed to a degree. It was servitude. And um, in no instance was servitude in Africa or was a servant in Africa regarded as non-human, subhuman, or animal? Or were they subjected to constant um, terror and savagery and just brutality? It was. There's no comparison um, to servitude and slavery. And so there's very few parallels, as I said, between the conditions of the servitude um, to which Africans subjected other Africans to and that to which the Europeans subjected Africans to. And um, yeah, and African leaders had no conception of the racism and the, the, the savage brutality and dehumanization that would befall their brothers and sisters that they were selling. They had no idea, no idea. Because at the core of who we are as African people is love is harmony like we don't we, we would never have done that undoubtedly i can i say that with conviction so um so yeah so so we will transition into the first phase so if you're taking notes we're doing we're going to go through six phases the first phase is 
the capture of Africans. That is the first phase, the capture of Africans. So the capture of Africans for the slave trade was usually carried out in one or two ways. The first one is through European-led or sponsored ambushes of um, either individual groups, um, I'm sorry, either of individuals or groups of African that were Africans that were overpowering them through night attacks or raids on the villages, or two through slave through trading for slaves with individual African leaders or chiefs. So once um, in ca in captivity, slave traders um, once in the captivity of the slave traders, enslaved Africans la enslaved African lives were changed forever. So let me take a little sip of water because I'm skipping over my words. Okay, hopefully that cooled me down. So first they were marched off the coast um, to be shipped to the Americas. And then um, the initial slave marches, uh, were they were often very long. They were brutal. They were frequently killing many Africans that were captured during that time. Um, and let's see, women were, were raped along the journey. Water was minimally rationed if given at all. The same with food. Families, loved ones, and friends were separated. And um, and, and you couldn't speak. You know, you, you were not able to verbally communicate. If you did, there would be um, violent uh, repercussions for that. And so the brutal enforcement of discipline and just the total submission on these initial slave marches um, it was unquestionably nightmarish for our ancestors, for, for Africans who had never experienced anything like that in their lives. Imagine you're minding your business, you're in your home, and then you're just kidnapped and taken away. Yes, Queen, um, phase one is called the capture of Africans. The capture of Africans, phase one. Um, and so raw violence was the, the essential mode of communication from slavers uh, to captured Africans. And we see that. That is, that is how, um, I guess, police and other white people, European people, or the dominant culture, that is how people in positions of power continue to speak to black people through that raw, violent communication style. So, um, so not much has changed in that way. And so we're actually transitioning into slave, into phase two, which is the slave march. So phase one was the capture of the Africans, um, which we said happened either one or two ways, through ambushes um, or through um, trading. So transitioning into phase two, we have the slave march. So from the moment of capture until the last breath on the plantations of the Americas, any and all failures to comply with any commands or demands of their capturers or enslavers were punished with a brutal whip at minimum, which literally tore a person's flesh apart. So um, at the initial kidnapping or capture, um, the objective of the slavers was to get as many Africans as possible to the slave ships with the least, with the least use of their resources, whether that was food, water, or time. So many uh, Africans who underwent this initial brutal phase of capture, they didn't survive. They died by millions over time, no doubt from either physical hardship or brutality or a combination of both. So Africans who did survive this slave march, this exhausting journey actually, they were placed in unimaginably dark and dingy and unsanitary overcrowded holding pens called dungeons. So now we're transitioning into phase three. Phase three of the Ma'afa is the dungeons. Phase three of the Ma'afa is the dungeons. And so, um, you know, they these these spaces were, um, were overcrowded. They were dirty. Um, they literally had to live, peace, peace sister. They literally had to live on their, um, their own excrements or excrements um you know i went to i was in ghana we visited ghana for two weeks it was beautiful absolutely stunning one of my definitely top three vacations i've ever taken um but during that trip we did visit um the dungeons we went to two to elmina castle and um elmina castle and cape coast i hope that's not the same my memory is just like just all over the place right now but in both spaces we were we were able to do some sort of a ritual me and my sisters and um and uplift the space and 
people do it often, you know, uh, folks go there to, to elevate the, the energy and, and the ancestors whose spirits remain there because you feel it. You feel it. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's very, very, very heavy. You feel it at the core, at the core. And I honestly, when I was going into prayer and at the time I was new to my spiritual journey, this was 2016. I think I only got like two minutes into the prayer and I stopped because I felt myself going into trance and I was just like this is too new for me and so you know one of my sisters took over the prayer but the energy is so strong it is so so strong um and the conditions were just completely dehumanizing and um they were often stripped of all clothing and just humiliated you know in this space um uh there was it's very very dark very very small windows very just just tiny if even just one window, not even, there was never more than one window, and it was always very, very small. Um, let's see. So, um, so at times, at this, at this space, at the, the dungeon, some Africans were, were branded with hot red, with red hot irons, like a cow or a horse would be. That's why we refer to it as chattel slavery, among many other reasons. Um, uh, their heads were shaven or shaved, both men and women, and they were placed in iron chains at the ankle or the neck, um, either during this phase of capture or at the boarding of the ship. So during this time, more more women were raped, um, and, uh, and, and they were just continued to be, they continued to be subjected to brutality, um, to be broken into submission, into listening um to to those to those european kidnappers uh and and here in this space too they died by millions as well in this space as well um so for those who did survive the middle passage um the next great challenge was surviving the the, the dungeons um, and so this holding or preparation phase could last anywhere from a few days or weeks to several months for some for some folks. And so Charles Charles Ball, he's a former former slave and writer on the enslavement experience. And I just wanted to read a little excerpt to you um, because this is a story that he was told by his grandfather and that he um, that he wrote about in, in 1854. And so it says, we were alarmed one morning, just at the break of day. The village was surrounded by enemies who attacked us. I was knocked down by a heavy blow of a club. And when I recovered, I found myself tied with a long rope. We were immediately led away through the forest and were compelled to travel all day as fast as we could walk. We traveled three weeks in the woods, sometimes without any path at all, and arrived one day at a large river with a rapid current. Upon a raft, we descended the river for three days, and when we came in sight of a large ship at the anchor in the river, um, let's see, he saw a white person for the first time ever who assisted him on the deck. Uh, it says, I had never seen white people before. The persons who brought us down the river received payment um, from the people on the ship of various articles, a keg of liquor, yards, blue and red cotton. People. People, people were sold for money. I mean, we know that, but for alcohol and, and cotton, insane. And so, um, so as I mentioned earlier, Cape Coast, Elmina, Dungeons, and other tourist sites in West Africa are examples of the horrifying past. They provide examples of the kind of environment through which enslaved Africans were processed like animals um, for the transatlantic nightmare. And so the brutality had to be an, an overwhelming physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual experience for the, the Africans, our ancestors, who were subjected to it. And it truly had to be just the worst nightmare that they could have ever just, there's no, you can't even imagine what they've gone through. I can't, I can't even imagine. And so just imagine chaos and insanity just dominating every moment of your day and of your life so excuse me so africans undergoing this ordeal they had to live they had at least within them at the very least 
they had to have held on to a strong sense of their culture. I can't think of no other way for them to have survived this experience without some sort of connection to a supreme power in the universe, whatever they called it, whatever, whatever, you know, they called their God, you know, or their ancestors. But there's, there's no way that they survived this experience without a connection to, to, to that divinity. And so, yes, as I said, so they use, they use their ancestors and their connection to God for healing aid, for strength, for endurance, and to survive, and also for protection. Um, a lot of people say, well, where was God when this happened? And well, God gave everybody free will. Why do European people use their free will to, to do this? Why are we blaming God for the acts of people? Of, of a person. A person made the decision to kidnap someone, rape someone, deny them of food, deny them of their just basic needs. And we're asking, why did God allow this to happen? Mm -mm. That, that wasn't God. God gave us all free will. Yes, there's things called divine intervention, but we came into this life with free will. And sometimes we have to live with the choices of our free will, even if it means that we are impacted by somebody else's choices that they are making with their free will. So that's how I view it. I don't blame God for this. All right, so let's transition into phase four. We have um, three more phases. So now we are at the middle passage. So in preparation for uh, the great voyage, uh, Africans were herded out of the dungeons and onto ships, often through tunnels beneath the, um, the coastal forts and the castles where they had been held in waiting. At the ship, they were counted, frequently washed down, holes down, uh, or doused with water or some sort of cleaning solution, and sometimes inspected for diseases by the ship's medical person. Um, they were then led to the lower deck and chained to the ship's interior uh, structure, which they called the, uh, the, the slave galley. So enslaved Africans were literally packed together, and, and um, you've seen pictures, I'm sure, if not. Um, just Google it. They, they were literally packed like sardines on these slave ships to, to maximize the amount of um, Africans that they can get on the boat, to maximize the utilization of the space. There was very little room in length or in the breadth between them. Um, and they had literally had, a, had as much space as someone would in a coffin, in a coffin. So the manner of this suffocating confinement alone took its toll on many African lives. And it was not uncommon for a seemingly health, healthy African person to, um, to die overnight from having um, suffered through these conditions. Uh, so many, if not most voyages, um, during many, if not most voyages, Africans were kept in this confinement throughout the entire voyage never being released until they disembark the ship. In some cases, they might be brought up to the deck of the ship during the daylight hours. So um, in 2016, that was, a, that was a good year for me. I went to Ghana and I, and, and I took ayahuasca. I, um, so in 2016, in December, I had a ceremony, a special herbal ceremony. Peace, beautiful sister, Alatia Ekale. Um, I... Excuse me. I had ayahuasca. I went through a you know traditional healing experience with the shaman and um, some of my sisters, and I received the mother herb. And um, if you're not familiar with ayahuasca, look into it. Very transformative. Um, peace, 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 y'all. It's a very transformative herb that. Um, oh my gosh, we can talk about ayahuasca another day. But um, during my ayahuasca experience, one of the intentions I set for that healing experience was to connect with my ancestors and so um they took me to the ship I was on a ship a slave ship um my hands were like this and I was up against the wall the wood wall all I could see was the brown wood it was moist and it was wet it smelled like salt like you know seawater 
um it smelled horrible it smelled like feces it smelled like um menstrual cycle it smelled like urine it smelled like funk and um that was all i could see they they refused to let me see anything else um than that than than, than just than smelling and just seeing that that wooden wall and um then the next place that i went during that healing experience um was to a slave plantation and i couldn't believe how beautiful it was believe it or not it was absolutely beautiful um, and it smelled like onions and the, and the earth was red and there was a beautiful woman just rocking on, on the, um, the patio of the house and, um, she was knitting, you know, or sewing or something like that, but they didn't allow me to see any trauma. They said no more trauma. You want to see so bad what we went to, what we went through, we'll show you a little bit, but, um, but yeah, so I just wanted to share that personal experience with you, um, yeah so whew, all right so let's get back to it so we're, we're still on um phase four the middle passage and so yeah so during the middle passage um our our ancestral mothers were were raped they were sexually assaulted and there's no doubt that men were, were also um were raped as well and subjected to other things um and thank you sisters thank y'all for receiving me i see your comments my pleasure um yeah ayahuasca is a very beautiful experience i've taken taken it twice and i'm good for a while during my last experience the mother herb literally whispered you good <laughs> you don't need to take this again because i was gonna do it every year and um and the, the the message i received was that the herb is in your dna once you take it it's there it never leaves you so it's not something that you have to do every year because it's such a strong and a powerful transformative um herb that you really don't need too much of it so um so yes yeah, so that is ayahuasca um okay family so just jumping right back into it so the reason why i don't i did not want to share these um these traumatic visualizations with you to to bring down the energy to bring down the vibrations but I want us to have a clear picture of the humiliation and the dehumanization and the degrad and the degrading of our ancestors. We need to know what they went through. It's so necessary for us to understand this so that we can understand the psychological impact of the Ma'afa on our present day community. Death. Life and death. Life and death is all they were subjected to. Not having enough. Lack. No clothes cutting the hair you know we wonder why we're so you know attached to these things to hair into clothing into things you know what i'm saying so that's why we have to know these things we don't bring these things up to you know be low vibrational or to harp on the white man being so terrible fuck the white man fuck the white man you know what i'm saying it's not about them it's about us understanding us us understanding who we are us knowing what healing we need to transcend the, the the oppression that is on our mind the colonization that is on our minds so that's why we're here today having this you know african language or african history study group that's that's what we're here for it's not to talk about them it's not to call that energy in it's for us to understand what happened so we can transcend it you ever just walk around just mad or just wake up mad and you don't know why you know we have to know these things okay so it was during the middle passage that literally millions of africans perished that they died they died as, as a result of um of diseases of overcrowding of suffocation of unbearable heat of unsanitary conditions of sickness of every kind of brutal punishment of suicide of of rebellions you know we rebelled i can't wait to talk about the rebellion oh, just just wait till thursday i cannot wait so yes yeah, so we rebelled you know our ancestors um they rebelled they rebelled so the length of the the voyage was about 40 to 80 days um so basically about two months 60 days was the average and the distance was anywhere between 3,000 to 60 to 6,000 miles. And um, it's estimated that about 50 million Africans were taken from the continent of Africa during this per per period. But of the 50 million, only a quarter of them, if that many, survived. So what this means is that the Atlantic Ocean itself is an African burial ground. 
Because what would happen is if sometimes if the if the ship was was overcrowded or if it was too heavy and, it, you know, like there was an issue with the ships functioning, they would literally just throw, just throw ancestors and throw our ancestors living alive into the water to make the boat lighter. Drink some water, sis. Drink some water. Drink some water. The whole enslavement of Africans from the beginning. Oh, I missed the question. What what is this time period? So we are on page we are on um phase four, which is the middle passage. So we began with phase one, which was the capture of the ancestors or the capture of slaves, and then we went to phase two, which was the slave march. Then we went to phase three, which is the dungeons, and we're currently in phase four, which is the middle passage. So yeah, so between the, the capture and getting, you know, on that boat or getting to the Americas, rather, 50 million Africans were kidnapped um, and only a quarter of them survived. So let's see here. So again, so there's little doubt that the Middle Passage traumatized our ancestors at a deep level of their being and that some of those deep-rooted effects of the, and that some of those deep-rooted effects were passed on to us. We know we know studies actually show, we didn't need studies to show this, right? But the, the West thrives on empirical data. Ain't nothing real until you, pr you prove it empirically, right? So now we have empirical data that says trauma can stay in the DNA. Trauma lives in the body. And they did this through the Holocaust. They did some big study by studying, um, you know, folk, the, the descendants of folks whose ancestors were um, subjected to the Jewish Holocaust, the Jewish Ma'afa, and, and they, there was trauma there. You know what I'm saying? So we didn't need that to know. We didn't need that study to know this to be true. But um, but yeah, this this is impacted us. And so one of the greatest uh, challenges that Black psychologists um, have to face is bringing this work into therapy and creating interventions, creating treatments that can um, undo you know, the trauma, you know what I'm saying? And so there's been an amazing amount of work for the last 70 years by brilliant black psychologists um, creating interventions and um, healing circles and different um, treatments. And so the work is there. We just need black people to connect with it. We have so many black mental health therapists, but they were trained by Europeans, right? So we have the DSM-5, that was normalized on European behavior, and we're trying to treat black people through behavior that that does not honor who they are. You know what I'm saying? Like the DSM five is used even if I I taught I not taught excuse me I um I did my clinical placement in England. In England, that's where I, I learned to be, that's where I was trained to be a therapist. I was trained in Tallahassee, Florida, and then I went to England to complete my training. And even there, they were using the DSM-5 because it's all European. You know what I'm saying? And so it's like, how do you expect me to treat this black child and what he's experiencing when this, 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 Diagnostic manual of behavior does not reflect his life. It doesn't reflect what he went through. And the same thing with standardized tests. You know what I'm saying? Okay, Omi Tutu. Omi Tutu, we're going to drink water. Ashe. Ashe. Ashe, 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 Ashe. So next is phase five. <sighs> Phase five, phase five. So phase five is the auction block. Um, so the auction block is the selling of Africans. So we have two more phases to discuss. So upon arriving at the port um, along the American coast, captured Africans who survived the brutal journey of the Middle Passage were herded out of the ship galley, um, sometimes washed down to be more presentable, and then they were marched to holding pens for sale. Um, on the infamous slave auction block, or they were sold to slave traders or large plantation owners who already had these, these contracts on them. So they would then go straight to the plantation. So they were always kept in chains, if not at the ankle, at the neck, 
um let's see and the chains were so tight that they were typically cutting into their flesh um enslaved africans were sold in one of several ways a slave owner would sometimes sell his or her slaves informally to a fellow slave owner to pay off debts because after all enslaved africans were currency they were a form of currency at that time right um or let's see or they would sell it to a slave trader who was in the business of buying enslaving which honestly sounds a lot like stocks but um, I'm not saying too much. So, um, so the auction was synonymous with breaking up families. The auction was synonymous with breaking up families. I would say, well, we know this. Um, present day auction block is jail. That is the equivalent to to present day slavery. And I mean, that's just like a physical place. We have mental slavery, but you know, we have more study groups. We could talk about all of this. So. Again, so at these or at the, the auction block, loved ones, parents, children, wives, husbands were all separated. Um, they had to say goodbye, knowing that they would never see each other again um, and that they were helpless from, from, from seeing each other or from saving each other from, from whatever unknown fate were coming, were, were coming for them. So um, again, it had to be very emotionally, psychologically exhausting for our ancestors our ancestors to have gone through this um hmm. so also during the auction sorry there's an ancestor who there's an ancestor who is saying that um also women when women were sold if they had on clothes they would pick up their skirts and show off their vag their vaginas um um and that in the books in in the textbooks written by white people is miswritten that they were crude and and vulgar and nasty but they weren't doing that to be crude nasty and vulgar they were doing that to show you that you came from me as a black woman i am the creator and the sustainer of the world and you have the audacity to sell me like an animal to sell me like an animal you came from me look at my vagina you came from me Woo! Black women are the creators and the sustainers of the world. We were then, we are now, and we will forever be. As a black woman, I don't have any, I, I am fine right now. I'm going to survive this. We done been through it all. I have no worries about any of this bullshit. I'm, we done, we done been through it. We done been through it. We were made for this shit. We were made for it. What are you saying? What fear? Fear of what? Oh, a virus? Okay. And what? I have my herbs. I have my prayers. Mm -mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Where are we now? Mm -mm -mm. So, yeah, so just, it was just an extremely demeaning experience, you know, um, very, very demeaning. So during this time, they would check the teeth, you know, they would be touching, prodding the body, looking into, you know, the, the, the cavities and the sex organs. And it was just, it was a terrible experience. It was a very, very terrible experience and they could do nothing. They could do nothing about it. And so, um, it was from the slave, um, auction block that they were then placed in chains um, you've probably seen like the, like, you know, chains in which people, groups of slaves were connected through, um, through the ankles or they were, you know, maybe even at the hands. And so from this, from that space, from the auction block, they would then, after just getting off the boat, um, have to walk. And even during that journey, you know, they were, they were, um, they were dying, you know? And so the women and the men were still subjected to rape and sexual assault during this journey at the hands of their new slave owner. So rape at every single stage. Oh, oh, I send love. I send love to the wombs of every African woman across the diaspora. I send love and healing to the wombs. I, I affirm that your cells are regenerated. I affirm that the trauma dissipates from your womb. I affirm healing. I affirm healing. Oh, so again, so they had to walk, 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 walk. Let's see, where are we now? 
During this time, it didn't matter rain, sleet, snow. It didn't matter what was going on. They still had to walk. Did they have clothes? No, they didn't have clothes. Um, so let's see. Where, where are we going now? Of course. I'm done. I can't even talk about the auction block no more. Let's go ahead and move on to life on the plantation. Ooh, I'm so glad this is the last one. This is the very last one. So now we are on um, life on the plantation for the enslaved Africans, phase six. Life on the plantation for the enslaved Africans, phase six. And don't worry, we're going to do our meditation at the end because we're going to have to bring it back down. I had a very peaceful day, you know, and it wasn't until I had to, you know, sit with this that I'm just like. But one day I'm a channel Francis Cress Wilson's peace. And I'll be able to talk about this without, you know, having an emotional reaction. So, you know, okay, so we're on the plantation now. So the plantation setup was um, something m many of you may be familiar with, but if you have not, you had the slave owner's house, which many ancestors called the big house. You had the slave row, which were the slave qu uh, quarters, which consisted of like these little lines of cabins, um, shanties, huts, shacks, many different names for them, but it was home for for our ancestors um and then you also had the house of the overseer that was in the same area and then throughout the plantation there were barns and sheds animals tools and um the harvested crops that were being stored so that is what what it looked like um on the plantation africans were given minimal clothing for surviving sometimes one jacket um and one pair of jeans were supplied to them annually and I just want to mention something that I saw on Black As Fuck. And it was at this moment that I stopped watching that show, Black As Fuck, on Netflix, when they said that black people have an affinity towards um, clothing and sneakers and designer because of wearing, um, only getting to wear nice clothes on Sundays during, you know, um, during the enslavement. They call it their Sunday's best. I totally disagree with that. I think that our flyness, our freshness comes from the ancestors in Africa. What you mean? We've been fly. We've been fly. Why we got to give all of our energy, our the best thing of ourselves? Why are we attributing it to trauma? I stopped watching after that because they did not have the appropriate consultants to talk about what they were talking about in that show, Black As Fuck. So for me, I'm like, this is the age of information. You have too many educated black women and black people for y'all to be putting out misinformation like that. We've been fly. We've been fly. Google a con. Google a con if you don't think we was fly before a fucking Sunday's best. What you talking about? I stopped watching because of that point, too. It was so inaccurate. It's in our DNA. Ashe. Ashe. Yes, my sisters. Yes, my family. Hoy. So where are we now? Um, so, yeah. So it was on the... It was in the environment of the plantation um, that we... Or that they were introduced to this concept of work. You work, you work, you work, you work. 24-7, seven, um, seven days a week if... You know, sometimes if they were Christian, they didn't have to work on Sundays, they would go to church, but for most, they worked. Um, so sleep and rest uh, was a luxury, um, and food as well. And it's sad because it's like, you know, if you don't work, you get beat. So if you're tired, and you need to rest in order to work, but if you rest, then you, 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 you it's just... You damned if you do, you damned if you don't. And so um, it's important for us to recognize the constant and the intense psychological, emotional stress condition and the sheer terror and desperation that characterized the life of, of the ancestors on slave plantations. It was exhausting, absolutely exhausting. From the time that the stars began to fade in the sky and the sun came out, work. When the sun which went down, maybe a little bit of uh, resting there, but it was work and work and work and work and work and work. And so, you know, these conditions, they led to, to just death, much death, um, misery, pain, suffering, terror, desperation, moment to moment. Okay, and so there were also, I'm gonna talk about this very briefly, there were also breeder plant, plant, breeding plantations and it was on these plantations in which they were literally forcing um, um, Africans to 
to create children, to create more slaves, to create more enslaved Africans, more enslaved black um, black Africans. Sometimes it was through, um, sometimes it had to be mother and father, um, I'm sorry, uh, mother and daughter, I'm sorry, mo mother and, and son, father and daughter, sister and brother, and things like that. So there was incest happening on these breeding plantations. Um, and I just, just, just so much love, sending so much love, heart space love, healing love from the best of me, from, from the best of God's energy, just to anyone who, who, who was subjected to that. I just cannot even imagine. And so, uh, let's see. So yeah, so we talked about it. Like life was literally lived on the edge and, um, life and death was, was was the the reality for our ancestors and so um just as much as the the violence was consistent or constant so was the resistance and so um I'm, we're gonna talk about the resistance we're gonna talk about what we did to resist um and just shift the narrative but again it was important for us to discuss what happened so that we can understand how this is impacting us psychologically I have had that feeling for so long, something agitating me. If I want to rest more or eat again, you just brought it full circle. Yeah, we deserve to rest. Um, one of my um, my sister friends, Cynthia Harris, and my godmother, Iolosha Osunyemi, they, they are advocates for black women who rest. And I honestly want to create a campaign with them called Hashtag Black Women Resting because we don't rest enough. We've just been just, it's just in the DNA to constantly be function, just going and going and going and going and going. And it's just so unhealthy and um, it devitalizes our life force energy. And we're not able to show up for ourselves, for our children, for our husbands, for our wives, for whomever, you know, we have in our life. And so um, rest, I encourage it. You deserve it. Rest is at the foundation of Ifa. In the first Odu, um, Ejiok Bay. You will not receive blessings in this life if you are not resting. You know, at the literally, enslavement is in opposition to who we are as African people. We rest because we know how important rest is for our health. This idea of working, this constant cycle of working nine to five, it does not belong to us. That's why we have so many of us becoming entrepreneurs, because we are rejecting this bullshit. The ancestral DNA is rising, and we don't want to deal with it no more. I'm done. I couldn't stand it. I worked for about probably 10 months for somebody, 9 to 5, before I resigned. I, and I resigned once once in between there, and then they begged for me to come back. And I did, and then I was like, I can't do it no more. And then I started doing fee-for-service work, which I was in total control. And I just resigned last week from that. You know what I'm saying? And so um, it does not, it's just, it doesn't work with my spirit to be in this constant state of go, 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 you know? And so um, so that was the six phases of the of the ma'afa. I'll just say it one more time for anyone who was taking notes, and then we can transition into the meditation portion of today's um, study group. So phase one of the Ma'afa is the capture of Africans. Phase two was the slave march. Phase three was the dungeons. Phase four was the middle passage. Phase five is the auction block, and phase six is life on the plantation. And at every single phase of that journey, was replete with death, with violence, with savagery. So, so yes. And again, the Ma'afa translates to the great disaster, and it is a key Swahili word. Um, so, yeah. So, let's just, let's take a little drink of water, you know, and a little, little oritutu, oritutu. Let me find some music for our meditation. And I appreciate y'all showing up and joining the live today. That's peace. That's love. That says a lot, um, you know, and please share it with someone who might not have had access to this information through their own education. Um, I think that I explained it in a way that at least someone as young as 11 could understand it. I hope I did. Um, I did curse a little bit, so I'm sorry. <laughs> But yeah, share this with your with your with your teenagers, with your preteens. You know, we need to be talking about these things. Um, 
And then make sure you tune in for the resistance part two. So let me find some music with some waves in it.